when it comes to, uh, you know, it's good to say, well, what, what comes to mind when you think about fellowship? And uh, for some people, uh, you know, it's the little time after, the, after church when you talk about the weather and your favourite football team. Uh, for some people, um, it's uh, great coffee and great biscuits. Um, and I was talking with Adam this morning and, and uh, don't uh, hear me saying that there shouldn't be any great coffee when you have fellowship. Uh, we're very thankful for what Adam does. Uh, when I said to him, great biscuits, we might be missing out on half our fellowship, he said he was trying to explain to me that uh, dry biscuits have as many calories as chocolate biscuits. So I wouldn't take that for gospel, but uh, anyway. But uh, I want us to see this morning that uh, fellowship is uh, perhaps far deeper and true fellowship is far more beautiful than often we think about. And uh, when I became a, a follower of Jesus, um, I, uh, I started to do a small group uh, Bible study with some other, um, uh, with some other people. And uh, I was told, you know, it's, it's really helpful. We, we need a fellowship. When you become a Christian, you become part of the body. And uh, it's a bit like, you know, you can have a fire and uh, it's just, it becomes like a bed of hot coals red hot coals and if someone comes along and kicks the fire apart or you take one of those coals and puts it out here by itself gradually it'll go out and uh, we need that uh, that coming together that we can glow together in in the Lord we need each other to uh, stimulate each other but uh, the issue was when I started uh, these small groups um, it wasn't the kind of people that I normally associated with. You know, it wasn't actually people that I would have chosen to be friends. We were actually, all of us had come from quite different backgrounds. I mean, uh, I was uh, studying architecture and, and I had to sit with engineers, people doing engineering. And, uh, and then there were even some IT people and uh, some science people that were you know, a little bit, uh, well, a little bit nerdy to me. And, uh, and, and I started to, um, and I actually said some things that were not kind at all. And, uh, and here I was in a Bible study learning how to be kind and in a fellowship where I wasn't kind. And um, the, the fellow who had helped me, uh, Ian, who had helped me to become a Christian, who had introduced me to the Scriptures, he said, um, I think we, we ought to have a talk about fellowship. And uh, I'm going to give you a bit of his talk that he gave to me many years ago. We're going to look at what is true fellowship and why we need true fellowship. And then how do we grow in true fellowship? Because true fellowship is not always what we think it is. Um, Ian gave me uh, two verses to memorise on fellowship. And here we are, uh, I'll have a go, see if I remember them, but that was 50 years ago. But Matthew 18, 20, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And I was learning that true fellowship is not about just getting together with people that, uh, you know, are, are just like me. God brings together his body for people from all sorts of backgrounds. And the key thing is that Jesus is central. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And then Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. And, uh, and God says that it's not just about coming together to chat. It's about coming together so that, yes, we share our lives, but we also share the life of God within us. And we want to encourage one another, and all the more, as, you, as we wait for the Lord, the Lord's return. Well, the, um, the Greek word um, koinonia 
everyone looks at Chris when they say Greek words, but to see whether they're right. But uh, what I read, that it occurs about 20 times in the New Testament. And it has the idea of having things in common, of, partic- of partnership, of participation, of sharing what is common. And, uh, and so a number of passages help us to just start to get a picture of what true fellowship is, is like. In 2 Corinthians 6, 14, he's talking about, in a sense, how we relate to the world and, and our personal relationships. He says, don't be yoked together with those who do not believe, for what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or, or what fellowship does light have with darkness? Or what agreement does Christ have with Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with the unbeliever? And so fellowship, true fellowship, has the idea of partnership, of uh, agreement, of having things in common. And, uh, and, and God uh, says... Uh, you know, I will be a father to you and you will be sons and daughters to me. So uh, Mr. Gupta takes us to the book of uh, Philippians. If you've got your Bibles there, we're, um, we're just going to read some passages from the book of Philippians. We're not going to read the whole book. You can do that at home. But the book of Philippians brings out a number of aspects of what it means to enter into true fellowship. Because uh, in chapter 1 and verse uh, 3 to uh, 5, he says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day to now. True fellowship looks like a partnership. We're in this together. And he goes on to say, you're all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defence and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. True fellowship, there's a personal love and care for each other that only God can really give us. And he finishes chapter 1 by saying uh, just one thing. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you that you're standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. Wouldn't it be a beautiful thing for people to say about us, as a fellowship, that we were standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. And he goes on in chapter 2 to say, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy... Make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. True fellowship means we start to look beyond ourselves. We start to look to the interests of others just as Jesus came from glory and entered into our experience. And when we experience true fellowship, we're starting to learn to see that we need to be concerned about each other and about the interests of others. He goes on in chapter 3 to talk about Timothy. He wants to send Timothy to see the church at uh, Philippi. And he says uh, in verse 20, I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interests. You know, could, could God send us into a group of people 
and know that, that it won't be about us. It will be about a care for other people, a care for their interests. And when you look at Epaphroditus in verse 25, what does he call him? He says, my brother, my co-worker, my fellow soldier. True fellowship, it means we're, we're all fellow soldiers in the, in, the, in the spiritual battle for what God is doing. Your messenger and minister to my need. And then we come to chapter 4. And chapter 4, um, many years ago, uh, we were given an assignment in the church I was at to memorise uh, Philippians 4. And uh, I can only remember a few words from it now. And I'll, I'll let you guess what words I can uh, still remember as we read it. But uh, chapter 4, he says, So then, my dearly beloved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and crown in this manner, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I urge Yodia and I urge Sintiki to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness or your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. And he goes on to say in verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because once again you renewed your care for me. You were in fact concerned about me but lacked the opportunity to say it. Still you did well by partnering with me in my hardship. You know, the only little phrase as I think of Philippians 4 is help those women. And, uh, it's a, and, and Paul was not being sexist in any way because he said these women had been co-workers with him in the gospel. And yet somehow in the church something had happened. And it wasn't just with women. Paul had to deal with men, you know, arguing with men, men opposing him, men and women not, you know, having problems. And part of true fellowship is where we start to see that the burdens people are going through, the troubles that our church is going through, the difficulties, they're each one of our responsibilities to help, to encourage, to support. True fellowship, first of all, begins with our relationship with God. In 1 Corinthians 1, 9, he says, God is faithful, you were called into fellowship. That's that same word. You were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's our calling, first of all. We're never really going to experience true fellowship with each other until we're at fellowship, we're at one with God, we've entered into a relationship with him. And in 2 Corinthians 13, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. It's, it's, it's what is true about us, the Holy Spirit dwelling within us and he alone can give us that true fellowship. You know, John writes in his letter in 1 John chapter 1, what we have seen and heard, this is about Jesus, what we've seen and heard we also declare to you so that you may also have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. To enter into a true fellowship with each other is first of all to see Jesus and to enter into a fellowship uh, with him. Because for each of us, a life that's been so messed up by sin can only be restored and healed and brought back into a true community through Jesus. Mr Gupta often takes us to the Old Testament. And uh, a couple of verses that came to mind... Uh, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, it says, Saul went, home, went to his home in Gibeah, and the men whose hearts God had touched went with him. 
And I thought that's a beautiful picture of true fellowship. It's not just a gathering of anybody. It's a bringing together of people whose hearts God has touched. And, and we've come from all sorts of different backgrounds. But God has brought us together because God has touched our hearts. It's like David's mighty men. In, I've been in, the, in our Bible reading, we've been reading through uh, 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Chronicles 11. And uh, God brought these, um, these, all these mighty men to serve King David. And it says they came with one mind and one heart to serve him. And uh, some of them just, uh, three of them just loved David so much when he said he was thirsty and they were in a siege. Uh, the three men just raced down and got some water at the risk of their lives. And David said, I can't drink this water that you risked your lives for. And it's a beautiful picture of fellowship, that leadership in a true fellowship is not taking advantage of people. It's not controlling people. It's not living off other people we're all one together we all need we've all got deep needs and we all love the Lord and uh, and he says uh, of Amasai then the spirit enveloped Amasai chief of the 30 and he said we are yours David we are with you son of Jesse peace be to you and true fellowship the Holy Spirit enables us to really say that that we belong to each other and we care for each other. True fellowship. So why do, we, why do we need true fellowship? Well, it was the pattern of the early church. In Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and to prayer. All the believers were together and they held all things in common. You know, um, we, we can be a pretty diverse group. When we first came to City Light, which was about uh, six years ago, um, one person came up to me, and uh, a young person, and uh, said, oh, it's so good to you, uh, see you. We've been praying for grey hair for our church. And um, I could have said, well, it cost me a lot of money to get it tinted uh, that way. But I said, uh, it's lovely that uh, we just felt so accepted. And I should actually qualify that uh, the church was very young at that stage. And uh, now God has brought much more, uh, you know, differences in ages, shall we say. Um, actually, Jackie celebrated her 80th uh, birthday yesterday. So we... We, God brings together what do we have in common. So it's not our age, it's, it's not our work, it's not always our personal preferences. You know, we can even barrack for different football teams and yet God brings us together as one. And, uh, and it's a common faith. You know, uh, Philemon says, I always thank God when I mention you in my prayers because I hear of your love for all the saints and the faith that you have in the Lord Jesus. We have a common faith in Jesus. We have a, a common gospel. As in, in Philippians 1, he says, your partnership in the gospel. And, and in, there's a beautiful verse in Philippians 1, 6. I'm sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We have a common work of God where in each one of us that has come to know Jesus, he's begun a good work and he's going to press on and, and complete it. But uh, not only was it the pattern of the early church, but we need each other's help. It's, uh, you know, in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. And, uh, you know, there are going to be times where we just feel alone and, and we feel as though what we are going through, no one else goes through. But God says, no, uh, you know, every temptation you face, it, it's common. And, but the danger is if we step out of true fellowship, we can get so inward-looking 
instead of and, and we need to recognize that with each other and learn to listen to each other and and what our struggles are but we also sharpen each other in proverbs 27 17 iron sharpens iron and one person sharpens another and i just look back and thank god for the men and women over the years that have just helped to sharpen me and to keep me uh, on the right track so um, one older man used to say to me um, you've got to stay near the spout where the gems drop out and uh, uh, if you're wondering what I'm talking about what he was talking about was we need each other and don't fall into the trap of thinking I've got to push through things myself true fellowship is where we can be open and honest and say well today I'm really struggling and uh, I just need a bit of encouragement I need a bit of help and or I'm not sure what to do and um, we had um, we're, we're um, we support a ministry with uh, international students at uh, Flinders Uni our son Mark's involved and uh, one of the interesting things was that um, is that um, international students can come to Adelaide from all over the world and uh, and yet they never get to see they can see their residential college they might see their flat where they live but they never see the inside of an Australian home they never get to visit and see what it's like for the average Australian so the group had the idea that uh, we, they could all come to our place on Friday night. So we had about uh, 20 students there and a lot of them were non-Christians, just people seeking and wanting to learn the truth. And I, I think it's a beautiful thing how God brings people from all over the world here uh, to, uh, and it may be the very time they get to hear uh, about Jesus. And... Um, and so, uh, and, and not only did they come to our house, but Ruth and I got interviewed as average Australians. Well, I had to say, well, we're not really that average, but I suppose, uh, you know, that's where we are. But uh, about our background and our family and how we had come to meet Jesus and so on. And, um, and I, uh, we just had our uh, air conditioning fixed uh, that day. And uh, so I, I had this uh, big uh, motherboard. I've got no idea really what a motherboard is. I asked, but I asked Mark and he said it was a motherboard. And it's like a big uh, electronic brain for, the, uh, for your air conditioner. And um, you see the people, I, I held it up and I said, the people who make, made this motherboard, they can come along and they can look at it and they can tell whether it's dead or alive. And uh, I wouldn't have a clue. And uh, in the same way, God made us. And he tells us whether we're dead or alive, whether we have the Spirit of God or not. And instead of just trying to fix up the motherboard, like this man, the mechanic who came to fix our air conditioner, he just took the old one out and he replaced it with a new one. And that's what God does in our heart lives he comes and he gives us a new heart he gives us a new life he gives us forgiveness through Jesus and and I I get sidetracked actually because they then said have you got any questions and uh, and one of the final questions was um, what is your word of wisdom to us and uh I said, Lord, help me, what do I do? And, uh, and I said, um, well, I think it's very important that as you go on in life that you get with the right people that are really going to help you. And that's what true fellowship is, that we can't be satisfied just with a busy social life. We, do, we can't separate ourselves out of the world because God has sent us into the world. But we do need to make sure that we're hanging around some people who are really going to influence us in the right way and take us on into a deeper walk with God, into a deeper understanding of ourselves and, and our needs. 
because God does say you do get influenced by the people that you associate with. And Jesus said, uh, go and make disciples of all nations, not just make converts. It's not enough to just be a convert. It's not enough just to attend church. We, we want to really grow and, and, and become a disciple. And, and godly counsel in fellowship is so important for that. And, and when I mean counsel, sometimes that can get distorted. You know, a fool's way, in Proverbs, a fool's way is right in his own eyes, but whoever listens to counsel is wise. Someone, a, a young fellow from the church came to me and said, oh, I just wanted to talk with you about something. And, uh, and I said, well, I'm happy to share with you how I see it, but if you don't do anything that I say, I'm still going to be your friend. Because true counsel is not, control and that can be the problem with churches can so easily want to control instead of true godly counsel is more helping people to lift up their eyes and see the problem as it really is what is the real issue and then helping them to follow Jesus and we as a church we we don't want to we want to be available and to help you but we really want to help you to meet with Jesus and follow him, not just do what we say or, or do what we, we do. So we need true fellowship. And, uh, and how do we grow in it? You know, the Bible has a lot of uh, one another verses uh, in, in, in it. And uh, we can't go through all those today. But... Uh, one of the verses, um, the, one of the best passages that helps me is 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, uh, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And how do we really grow in true fellowship? It's when we start ourselves to walk in the light that God gives us. And... Because of the blood of Jesus that has forgiven us all our sin, we can have a confidence that we can share with each other where we are because we don't have to prove anything ourselves. We can say, Lord, I'm forgiven. Today has been just a hard day and I need some encouragement, some help, or I don't know what to do here in this situation. And God can give us wisdom and, and insight. Uh, in it Uh, in Romans 15 15 um, uh, we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good to build him up and uh, in verse 7 of that chapter welcome one another accept one another that's a beautiful thing that we can accept people from just vastly different backgrounds we're not accepting sin we're accepting the person and uh, and God can start to change us all to have that outward look because in Ephesians 4 25 he says we are members of one another we're in the same family we belong to each other so he says don't grieve God's Holy Spirit let all bitterness and anger and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you, along with all malice. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. That doesn't mean we don't have to set up boundaries with certain people, but it means as we start to see how much God has forgiven us, we learn to forgive others. And, uh, and we can even forgive the person who points out our grey hair when we arrive. We can forgive, but we can forgive so much deeper things in our lives because we start to meditate on how much Christ has forgiven us. And then we, we start to see practical needs in the lives of others. 
in Hebrews 13, don't neglect to do what is good and to share. That's that same word for fellowship, to, to share God's life, God's provision with others. As it says uh, in the message, make sure you don't take things for granted and go slack in working for the common good. Share what you have with others. And finally, I just uh, want to say pray for one another. James 5, 16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. You know, Elijah was a human being just like we are and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and for three years and six months it didn't rain and then he prayed again. And sometimes, you know, as we look at each other, we've got we can say we've got deep problems in our lives and then we see deep issues in others and and God just encourages us with this story of Elijah who was just as human as we are he had his issues but he prayed and true fellowship as we care for one another as we pray for one another God can do a beautiful thing and we can learn to bear each other's burdens and enter in to true fellowship. You know, as we come around the table this morning, that's one of the things that is true for all who have come to Jesus and put their faith in Jesus as Lord and Saviour, that he is our common Saviour, our shared Saviour, and we have entered in to that life, the life of God. And so we can come this morning around the table just with thankful hearts that God has brought us into true fellowship with him, first of all, and then with each other as his body. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for your goodness toward us. We thank you for this true fellowship that we can experience both with you and with each other. And so we pray that you'll really help us to grow in this, in the power and strength of the Holy Spirit. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.